Amen. Well, you may be seated, family. And as you do that, grab your Bibles, grab your notebooks and your pens. Because I want to encourage you to take notes as you go along. You'll grow so much faster that way. If for whatever reason you don't have your Bible with you, you can go to our church app. If you open that up on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see a little block that says notes. If you click on that, that'll give you the notes for this evening and obviously the scriptural reference. But a Bible is so much better. Amen. Well, family, tonight I'm going to be talking about a very interesting topic. It is something that all of us go through. Every believer goes through this, every single one. No matter who you are, even if you go through the pages of the Bible, the only one who was exempt was Jesus. But we all go through it, but none of us want to admit it. None of us want to admit it. The truth is that you either have experienced this, you're going to experience it, or you're in it right now. So, with that, turn with me to the book of Revelations. Book of Revelations, and no, this is not an end time message. (laughs) Even though it's at the end of the book, it's not an end time message, but we're going to read from Revelations chapter 2. And before we get there, in Revelations 2 and 3, if you read through that, you will see that there are seven letters written to the current churches of that time. And the very first letter is written to a church called Ephesus. Ephesus, and this is what the Word of God says in Revelations 2 from verse 1, and it says this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write. So let me put a pause right there. When it says to the angel of the church, that word to the angel really means to the messenger, or you could say in modern terms to the pastor of the church, the one who was leading this church. And this letter is given or written to the pastor so that he can share it with his congregation. It goes on and says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So that's referring to Jesus. So Jesus now is saying something to this church. What does he say? Verse 2, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Wouldn't you say that's a great report? That's a great report right there. The church over there is doing a great job. But listen to verse 4. Verse 4 says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So they were doing a lot of good stuff, but they've forsaken the love they had at first. You know, as I read these verses and as I was reading through them, these first verses, kind of all four of them actually, reminded me of being back at school and getting a report card. How many of you got report cards. I don't know what it's like now. I think it's all electronic, but I know when I was at school, specifically at the end of the year, you would go to school to get your report card. And normally your parents would go with you. (laughs) So let me do a bit of a survey quickly. How many of you loved getting your report card? Just show me. Love. Raise your hand. Wave at me. You love getting your report card. We see you and we don't like you because you guys all got the A's. And you wanted to show off to mom and dad that you were doing great, right? How many of you weren't so excited about getting your report card? See, there's more of you. I'm in the better crowd. You see, for me, school was really about sport. The academics, I thought, were just a fill-in because it was a waste of time, you know? All about sport. And so you got your report card, right? And your report card did what? Well, your report card kind of told you that there were areas you were doing well in, And there were some areas that, let's just say, needed some improvement. (laughs) Okay, that's what your report card did. And now, obviously, you would uh, see these things that needed some improvement, and you would know, hey, I have to to, uh, uh, jack up here. These marks are not great. And so, in other words, it tells us these areas. Hey, guys, you're doing good here, but you're not doing so good there. And that's what we read when we read this account of the church in Ephesus. They were doing a lot of good stuff. We could see that. But they were struggling spiritually. That's what it said. They were struggling spiritually. Now, if I could choose some verses to describe me, I would love to have verses like this to describe my life. If I could choose some verses to define uh, my walk with God, I would love these to be them. And I hope one day I can honestly say they will be. So let's just look at some verses that I think all of us, including the church of Ephesus, would like to have describe them. For example, Psalm 69 verse 9, it says, Zeal. For your house consumes me. 
Can you imagine if somebody says, hey, Pastor Jenny, when I look at you, I can see that zeal for the house of God consumes you. Wouldn't that be a great something to say over somebody? Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. I love this one. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? How about Psalm 63, verse 1? Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And one more, Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Aren't those amazing verses? You know, we would all love our spiritual lives to be defined by verses like that, amen? All of us. But family, the truth is, it doesn't always look like that. That's just the truth. It doesn't always look like that. When we go through times in our relationship with God, and depending on how long you've been serving the Lord, there are times as you walk with your, in your relationship with God that it can be described at times as being difficult, or even at times you can feel a little bit disconnected from God. Isn't that true? Sometimes it feels that way. And so tonight, I want to speak or talk to you about what everybody goes through but doesn't always want to talk about. And the title of my message this evening is Navigating Spiritual Ruts. Navigating Spiritual Ruts. Sometimes we get into these ruts in our spiritual life, and really they're not good for us. You see, church, when we get into these ruts, it affects every part of our life. It can affect our jobs. It can affect our families. It can affect our relationships with our friends. It affects our attitude. And most definitely, it affects our walk with God. But I want you to know that we are not the first ones to experience such things. We're not the first people to go through spiritual ruts. If you look in your Bible, I'll just mention a few. There are many, many more. But if we go through the Bible, we'll see somebody called Moses. Moses went through a spiritual rut of 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years. Look at Elijah, amazing man of God. He did such awesome miracles on Mount Carmel. But if you keep on reading through the story after that, he found himself in a spiritual rut not so long after that. How about David? The Bible says about King David that he was a man after God's own heart. But he made some mistakes. And he made some wrong choices because he was in a spiritual rut. And so this evening, church, I want us to look at this message in three ways. We're going to firstly define what it is. What is a spiritual rut? Let's define it. The second thing we're going to look at is what gets us into these spiritual ruts. And the good news is, how do we get out of it? How are we going to get out of it? So the first one is, what is it? What is a rut? And whenever you want to find a good dictionary definition, you go to Google. <laughs> and you go to dictionary.com and you look up a definition for the word. And so the, I found two definitions that I like. And the first one is this. This is a definition of a rut, okay? It's a long, deep track made by the repeated passage of the wheels of a vehicle. Let me read that to you again. A definition of a rut is a long, deep track made by the repeated passage of the wheels of a vehicle. Now, I know some of us in this auditorium and maybe some of you online, we enjoy going off-roading. But a four-by-four four stuff, getting out there. We enjoy that, right? I enjoy that. I've had some good experiences. I've had some not-so-good experiences. But we've had some fun. And when you go off-roading, <clears throat> I don't know about you, I'm a clean car guy. I like a clean car. Who likes a clean car? Wheel shiny, car clean. I like that. But from time to time, you don't mind getting a bit of mud on it because you're having fun. You're out there, four by four, and you really go for it. I'm not like Pastor Andre who gets the more water in his car than on the outside. But anyway, I'm not, I don't think I'm there quite there yet. But we enjoy that type of stuff. Now, when you're four by fouring and you're out there, you can be driving on a road and everything's great and you're having a great time and you're just cruising along. Then all of a sudden, you hit these uh, paths that have been carved out in the road. And have you ever seen that? It's two paths between the grass where cars have repeatedly gone. And as cars have gone over it over and over and over, that part of the road is not so smooth. 
So when you hit it, the vehicle shakes around a little bit. It's not so stable. It's not the greatest part of the road. And so you find yourself going from a nice smooth drive into this bumpy, uncertain, what's happening experience. Now, there's two things that are very important when you hit those ruts, when you hit those things, if you are four by four and off-roading. Two things that are very important. The first one is you've got to stay alert. You've got to start looking what's happening around you. You've got to know, where am I placing my wheels when I'm going on that road? You've got to keep focused. That's the first thing. The second thing is you've got to keep moving. You see, I had experience of not keeping moving. <laughs> I got very stuck. <laughs> so you've got to keep moving. And you see, family, it's the same in our spiritual walk with God. When you're going along and you hit that bumpy time where things are not great, you've got to be alert of what's happening around you. But you can't stay still. You have to keep moving. And that brings me to the second definition. When I looked up the second definition of the word right, it said this. A habit or pattern of behavior that has become dull and unproductive but is hard to change. We go from a place in our life where things are unstable and now we stay there and it becomes a pattern of behavior, your life becomes dull, unproductive, and now you're stuck in it. It's hard to change. That's the challenge of what happens with ruts. Now, yes, two truths about spiritual ruts. The number one is spiritual ruts are common. We read about it. We spoke about different men of God that got into it. So they are common. People do go through them. And the second truth about a spiritual rut is this, that spiritual ruts are normal to be in but never okay to stay in. They're normal to be in, but never okay to stay in. Now, church, this is not an approval statement. I'm not saying, I don't want you to walk out here and say, well, Pastor Greg said, well, it's okay for us to be in them. Now, I'm not saying that. This is just an acknowledgement statement. I'm just acknowledging that this happens. You see, family, we can't let commonality become an excuse for regularity. You cannot allow commonality to become an excuse for regularity. You see, everybody's doing it. Well, pastor, don't you know, people are just, they're not going to church every weekend. I know a lot of Christians, pastor, well, they're just not reading the Bible. They say they love Jesus, so if everybody's doing it, it must be fine. No, 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 family. It's not fine. Just because others are doing it doesn't make it right. You see, the enemy wants to keep all of us in a rut. You want to know why? Because when you are in a spiritual rut, you are ineffective for the kingdom of God. You're ineffective. And that's why it says here in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert, be alert, be on watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking. And if he's looking, we must be looking. We've got to be alert. He's looking to see who's the weakest in the pack. Who's the one that I can get so easily? You see, family, you want to know where devouring happens? Devouring happens in extended seasons of spiritual ruts. If you're stuck in an extended season of spiritual ruts, it's like you're the weakest animal in the pack. And the devil says, that's the one I'm going to go for. So we've got to be careful of that, right? So now we've defined what it is. Let's see how do we get there. How is it that we get into these spiritual ruts. Well, let's learn to ask ourselves three questions. We need to learn to ask ourselves these questions on a regular basis that will help us to gauge where we are at in our walk with God. In June, a number of the, the, the team here, management team, we went on a trip in June. We did, I think it worked out, my speedometer said 2,353 kilometers in seven days. That's a lot of driving. It's a lot of driving. We did that, okay? And when you're driving on these long distances, for me anyway, I'm constantly looking at the gauges of my car, constantly. I'm just looking down, driving, looking down. Why am I doing that? Because I'm making sure everything's good with the car. I'm making sure the car's running well. Sometimes you're driving on roads that are quite remote. and You can't afford to get stuck out there. So you're always looking. Anyway, I am. I drive that way. I'm constantly looking down at the gauges, making sure everything's good. There's no little lights flashing there. It's not Christmas time, you know. <laughs> Everything needs to just be happy. So I do that. I look at that because I want to make sure everything's good. And the truth is, 
We need to do the same spiritually. We need to have questions or gauges that we ask ourselves to make sure everything's going good. And so let's look at some of these. There's three of them. The first gauge or the first question you want to ask yourself is, how am I spending my time? How am I spending my time? You see, family, is God first in your life? Is he first? Or is he somewhere on your list? Is he somewhere? Do you get to him eventually at some part of your day? Or is he first? Is he the very first part of your day? When you wake up in the morning, do you reach for Jesus or do you reach for your cell phone? Is he number one? Are we first checking what our latest friend's statuses are or we do want to know what the status of heaven is? And I'm saying, is he the first part of our day? Is Jesus the first part in our family? Is he first? Is he first in our finances? This is the first Sunday of September. First Sunday. Have we put him first? When we received our salary, have we put him first? Is he the first part of our finances? Is he first in our thoughts? Or is he lost? Do we first figure out everything else and eventually say, well, I better just go to Jesus. I can't figure it out myself. Is he first in our thoughts? You see, church, if he's not first in this area of our thoughts and our life, this is the biggest cause that relates to time regarding spiritual ruts. We're getting to a place of what we call neglect. Neglect. We start to neglect the foundational disciplines. We stop reading our Bible daily. We're not praying daily. We start missing church services. We don't worship God the way we used to. We always used to play worship car, music in the way to, to work in the car. Maybe we're not doing that anymore. We used to attend group all the time. We start missing one week, two weeks. We stopped serving in the house of God. One week leads to two, two to a month before we know it's a year gone by. And we started neglecting all these things. So we've got to be careful of that. You know, in our modern world, in our, we're talking about cell phones, <laughs> You get this little logo that comes up that says 5G. How many of you have seen that on your phone? 5G. Now, when you've got 5G on your cell phone, everything is operating lightning fast. Emails are coming down lightning fast. Pictures are downloading fast. Videos are downloading fast, right? It's like your, it's like your phone is on steroids. But then you're driving along, and you hit an area where maybe it says 3G or LTE, or I don't know how many you get sometimes that little H. I don't like the little H. More like H, not H. And you get that H or 3G, all of a sudden it looks like your phone's dead. Nothing's happening. It just takes forever to download stuff. You see, family, the connection is still there. It's just not as strong. The connection is still there. It's just not as strong. And that's what happens when we get into spiritual ruts. You don't lose your salvation, but you do lose your intimacy with Jesus. Still got the connection. But because of all our neglects, we don't have that strong connection. You see, when we feel distant from God, every single time I can guarantee you it's not Him. It's us. Every single time it's not Him. It is us. And that's why Jesus said to us in Matthew 6, 33, He said this, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, all the stuff you need in your life will be added to you if you'll just put him first in your life. So the first challenge is neglect. We get to a place where we neglect. The second question or the second gauge you want to ask yourself is this. Am I staying close to Jesus? Am I staying close to Jesus? You see, church, often our closeness to Jesus is hindered by this little word on the screen there, sin. Just this little word affects our closeness to Jesus. And when we let Satan in, we get sin. When you let Satan in, you get sin. And this is the thing with Satan. He doesn't come and just bombard you with something ridiculous. Well, okay, let's all go out and rob a bank. He'll obviously say no, but he just subtly gets in, subtly gets in. You see, Ephesians 4.27 says, And do not give the devil a wide open door. Is that what it said? 
No, it says don't give the devil a foothold. Don't even let him get his foot in the door. Because if you allow him to get his foot in the door, church, it's not long before the door is wide open. I love this statement. I received it many, many years ago. I've never forgotten it. It says never give the devil a lift because you will always want to drive. You let him in on the back seat of your life with something small. It's just a little lie here. It's just a little cover up there. It's just a little untruth. Maybe at the staff party, we just have a few sips of something we shouldn't. All small things that because you feel you can handle it. But it's not long, friend, before he's in control. And so the second thing we must be careful of is sin. The second thing that causes a spiritual rut is not staying close to Jesus. The third cause of why people get into spiritual ruts is the third gauge you want to ask yourself is, am I growing? Am I growing? Is my life the same or am I growing? Am I taking next steps in growing closer to Jesus? If not, then I'm stagnating. And that's the third challenge, stagnation. You never want to be a place in your walk with God where you're stagnating. You see, when a person is stagnating, listen to this, they are still going to church. They're still reading their Bible. They're still praying. Nothing has changed. That's the problem. Nothing has changed. It's just the same old, same old. Just doing the same thing. I'm just going and doing the same thing time after time. It becomes routine. Eventually, it becomes like a Christian to-do list. Tick, well, I went to church. I went to church. Hey, well, I've read my Bible. That's the thing I have to do. Tick. You know, oh, yeah, well, okay, I went to cell group. Okay, tick. It just becomes a Christian to-do list. We're doing the things of God, but where's the God of the things? You know, there's a man called Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers came to know Jesus under Charles Spurgeon's ministry. Charles Spurgeon was known as the Prince of Preachers. He lived in the 1800s, phenomenal minister of the word. This man, Oswald Chambers, came to know Jesus in his, through his ministry. And Oswald Chambers became an amazing evangelist and he preached holiness. Listen to the statement he made. I love it. He says, beware of anything that competes with loyalty to Jesus Christ. The greatest competitor of devotion to Jesus is service for Him. You think because you're serving and you're ticking off the list that all is good because you're going through the motions. Well, I'm serving Him. I'm at church. I'm in group. I'm just going through the motion. But do you know Him? Do you have that intimate relationship with Him? Friend, we've got to be careful of stagnation. You know, on this trip that we went on in um, June, we went to a place called Okrabis. Okrabis has got some most of the amazing water features. Amazing rivers and, 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 and uh, what do you call those things? Uh, waterfalls. Amazing. Gushing rivers. I mean, that river, you can just see it's full of life. It's full of life. But you can be walking along that same place, and we saw it. You're walking along the rocks, and there's a pool of water. That water comes from that vibrant river, but it's still, there's no movement. It's dead, it's going all green, but it comes from the same source. And that's what happens when we stagnate. We fail to move. And when we fail to move, unfortunately, we become nasty like that water. Nothing is alive in our life. And Jesus in Matthew 15, 18 said this. He says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're saying the right things. But their heart's not in it. That's a, ch a challenge with one of the uh, spiritual ruts is stagnation. We're doing the things, but there's no more passion there. And we've got to be careful of that. So family, this evening we've looked at the things that get us into a rut, neglect, sin, and stagnation. And I want you to know this evening that I believe that if you're in any of those, if you're stuck in any one of those three, or maybe all three, if you're stuck in those, I believe tonight God's going to set you free. He wants you free. He wants you to have a vibrant relationship with Him. I mean, I believe He's going to do something special in your life. So let's look at the third and final part. Is, and the last question is, how do we get out? We know what it is. We know what gets us in. But how do we get out? Well, here's a simple recipe. It's found in the same portion of Scripture in Revelations chapter 2. When we started off, we read verses 1 to 4 about the good report. We read about what they weren't doing. And in verse number 5, is the recipe. Look at the recipe. Very simple. 
In Revelations 2, 5, it says this, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, church, if I don't, I will just continually be stuck in a spiritual rut and my life will be meaningless. I've got to be careful. I've got to be careful. So if you are in a spiritual rut or you have been in one or you end up being one in your future, remember this is how you get out. Let's look at that portion of Scripture again. The first portion in Revelations 2 says this, consider how far you have fallen. Consider. Consider. In other words, ponder. Think about it. Apply your mind to understanding. That's what it means. Apply your mind to understanding. In other words, identify where you are. Identify, where am I? If you're out of a spiritual rut, you want to remember what it was like to be in one. You want to remember that. If you are in one, you want to consider. Remember where you have been. Why? So in the future, you don't go there again. How many of you have ever slammed your finger in a car door? Next time you close the car door, you remember. <laughs> right? It didn't get stuck again. That's the point. You don't want that pain, right? And so I'm saying the pain of not being where you need to be with Jesus, consider that. Remember it. It's very, very important. So the first thing is to identify where you are. The second solution or part, it says there, remember to do the things you did at first. Remember. In other words, surrender, sorry, repent. Repent and do the things you did at first. So in other words, surrender to Jesus. Repenting is just surrendering to Jesus. You see, family, there has to be a moment in our life when we find ourselves in this situation where we surrender, where we identify where we are and we turn to Jesus so He can show us what to do. We need to do that. You see, some of us might just need a good old-fashioned time of repentance. Lord, I'm sorry. Just, Lord, I'm sorry. Don't just complicate it. Just, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I haven't been, I have been doing what I need to do. Just turn to Jesus. You see, repentance is an amazing word. So many times we see repentance as a big stick. It's not a big stick. It's a great word. Repentance means this. I'm going in this direction, which is wrong. Just turn around and go back to my Savior. That's all it is. Repentance means there's a better way. So all we need to do is say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm turning. I'm coming back to Jesus. I love what Job 22, uh, 23 says. I love this verse. Listen to this. It says, if, in other words, decision, if, you return to the Almighty. You will be restored. I love that. You will be. If you turn back, you will be restored. So clean up your life. Listen to this. You can be a million steps away from Jesus, but you're only one step back. You could feel you're so far, but it just takes one step to come back to Him. And the third and final thing is do the things you did at first. Go back and do the things you did at first. You see, family, once we've identified where we are and where we've missed it, we've considered it, we've surrendered and repented to Jesus, the third thing is simple. Take action. Take action. Do something. You know what's wrong. You know what you have to do. Do it. You've wanted to. You know you have to. Now's the time. Why wait? Why wait another day? Why wait another week? Make the decision tonight. Say, I'm going to do it tonight. I'm going to say sorry. I'm going to turn. I'm going to make a decision. You see, here's the thing with uh, taking action. Every action begins with a decision. You have to decide. You have to make the choice, I'm going to do it. So church, why wait? I want you to say this with me this evening. Say, today, I decide it's time. Amen, we're gonna do it now. Why wait another day, another week? Let's close the service off a little differently. We're gonna close the service off a little differently. We're gonna have a time of commitment and recommitment. We're going to have some time of worshiping the Lord in some ministry. And I believe, church, I really believe it, that any of you that are caught in a spiritual rut, God is going to help you. And you might say, well, pastor, I'm not in a spiritual rut. But maybe you just need a fresh touch from God. And He's going to do that this evening. So I want to leave you with some detailed practical steps. Detailed practical steps. Here they go. For those in a rut because of neglect, the first thing you need to do is it's time to prioritize God again. Not next week, tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, God first. I'm going to prioritize God first. Because I've been a rut of neglect, it's time to get back into a daily routine. 
Get back to praying every day. Get back to reading the Bible every day. Get back to being in church every Sunday. It's time to start serving again. You served in the house of God and you stopped. It's time to get back. Time to commit to that, to serving in the house of God. And for those that are in a rut because of neglect, it's time to reinstate that accountability call. There were people you walked with in your relationship with God who were accountable to one another. You need to get that back. You need to have people in your life that can tell you, hey, be careful. You're on a slippery slope here. Let me pull you back. You need to be that person to somebody else. For those who find themselves in a rut because of sin, well, it's very simple. The first one, it's time to repent. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. It's time to allow yourself to be restored. So many times when people mess up, they beat themselves over their head over and over and over. Just let it go. We'll help you if you're battling with that. If you're struggling with that, come to Christian Family Church. We'll connect you to some people that can help you on your journey and walk in victory and in freedom. And for those that are caught in a rut because of sin, it's time to turn from something and turn to Jesus. Just simply make the decision, I'm going to do it. And then thirdly, for those in a rut because of stagnation, it's time to keep showing up. Let's be consistent. Let's just be consistent. Let's keep on doing the thing we know we need to do. It's time to change things up. Maybe tomorrow morning, pray in a different place. You're praying every morning. Maybe just change this place that you sit. Perhaps you need to just buy a new Bible. You say, why would I need a new Bible? Perhaps you've had one for five or 10 years and you're looking at the same highlighted verse you're reading the same revelation you got five years ago. Get a clean one. Let God start speaking to you again. Make some new notes. Maybe it's time just to get a new Bible. And for those that are caught in a rut because of stagnation, it's time to initiate new growth. If you haven't done Growth Track Church, don't get on it just because we advertise, them, advertise it. Get on it because it's a track that will help you grow. That's what it'll do. It'll help you to discover what I need to do in my life. Get part of it. It's time to join a group. If you're not in a group, don't allow your life to be stuck in that stagnation. You don't want to be that pool of water that there's no movement. Get involved in group life that you can do life with one another. So say with me this evening, it's time. It's time. I want to read to you Isaiah 43, 19. This is a promise from God to you this evening based on this message. And I've highlighted all the eyes because God is speaking to you. And it says this, For I, God, am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the, uh, the dry wasteland. God will do that for you and He's going to do it for you tonight. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.